Welcome back to another round of Bases Picks. Now, there's three pretty interesting cards on. However, we're going to do main events. Going to do a couple of the undercard fights for the card in the UK. Purely because I'm a bit more knowledgeable on that one. No big in-depth breakdowns, technical analysis, anything like that. We're just going to go general vibes, general feels from the weigh-ins, things of that nature and go straight to the predictions and just a brief bit about how I think each fight is going to kind of play out. So hopefully this video won't be too long, but as always, please like and subscribe, share with a friend, a colleague, a relative, an associate, an enemy and anyone in between. It's all appreciated. That being said, let's get into the matchroom card taking place tomorrow. Okay, so first up on this card, we're going to talk about the now no longer chief support, um, thanks to Derek Chisora, but Philip Ergovic versus Dempsey McKean. Orthodox versus Southpaw. Dempsey McKean, I believe, is about six foot seven. Uh, yeah, about six foot seven, maybe six foot seven and a half. Southpaw, fairly lean, um, quick feet, obviously awkward, tricky, and quite rangy. You got Philip Ergovic, who I believe is six foot five. Uh, he could potentially be six foot six, uh, but he's obviously naturally orthodox. Uh, Philip Ergovic came in, I believe, at around 242 pounds, and Dempsey McKean, I think, came in at around 248, uh, somewhere on there. Now, they're both in actually pretty good shape, so Philip Ergovic has looked very fleshy in previous bouts. It looks like he's taken this one serious, or at least he's had enough time to train for it. So he's looking in pretty good shape, but so is uh, Dempsey McKean. One thing about Dempsey McKean, he's got he's got pretty good movement. He's pretty handy. Um, but I've seen in several fights of his, he has been buzzed quite badly, um, even by, you know, I guess what you would call maybe non-punchers now to his credit he's always come through those moments and uh seems to recover fairly quickly from those particular um instances however i don't know if he's been in there with a puncher the level of philip hergovic and not just a puncher the size of hergovic but someone that is also very dirty uh, to put it politely look Filip Ergovic like he will punch around the back of the head um, he'll punch around the back of the ear he'll you know hold he'll sort of hold your head down and um, you know sort of punch downward trajectories he'll sort of hit from angles that you're not really allowed to really shoot shots from and he seems to get away with it uh, also he does have a very good jab now this will just be about whose jab can get to the target quicker I have seen Hergovic move his head a bit more than I've seen Dempsey McKean in the past. So if it if it just goes straight to straight, I think Hergovic will possibly get to the target a bit quicker. Um, but Dempsey McKean does have the footwork. So if he does get caught, there is a potential that he can maybe adjust his feet and move out of range slightly quicker than Hergovic can and ultimately be able to get himself into a position where either he can then employ a clinch or just uh, get himself back together and get back on his jab. Now, he's not been in this situation before. Um, this is his big shot, so I definitely think he's going to give it his all. However, I do think that just the natural ability of Hergovic, plus, I guess, the feeling that he needs to correct the, you know, the, the performance he had against Zhang Jale back last year, I feel like he's going to come in a lot more focused a lot more switched on obviously a lot more attentive to you know sort of to the task at hand and i do see him getting a stoppage in this fight uh sort of around about sort of round seven for round eight i wouldn't be surprised if it happened sooner um i would be a little bit surprised if it did happen later sort of 10 11 and i'd be very surprised if it went to points but that being said, yes, I do think Filip Ergovic does win this fight VR sort of KO stoppage by the referee sort of between round seven and eight. Now, time for that chief support. You've got Derek Chisora versus Gerald Washington. Now, Gerald Washington is a very good fundamental boxer with good movement and good skills. Now, 
if you look at the fight that he had when he fought um, Adam Kovnatsky, where he got KO'd in the second round, the biggest mistake he made in that fight was basically trying to fight Kovnatsky toe to toe. He's, he decided just to sit in the pocket with him and trade with him, and that was Kovnatsky's game. And this was a Kovnatsky before Robert Hellenius had got to him. So. Uh, yeah, he just basically shot the wrong tactics. He started off well jabbing behind the, you know, sort of behind the, the lead hand moving and then just decided to, to stand and trade. Now, my suspicion for that is that he didn't train that well and he realized he wasn't going to be able to jab and move for the length of time that that fight was going to take. And because of that, he thought, you know what, let's just go at it because I feel like I've got power and I can, you know, I can take you on. But, you know, the shorter, stockier, guy basically dealt with him inside two rounds because of that Derek Chisora is a pressure cooker he's a he's a come forward ambush fighter you know exactly what you're going to get there's no airs and graces he's not going to try and out jab you he's not going to try and you know counter punch you he's going to just walk forward he's going to sit on your chest he's going to throw big shots I don't think that Gerald Washington is going to be able to get out of the way of a lot of those shots. I do think ultimately he is going to be put in the same situation where he's not going to box a move. He's going to try and engage Derek Chisora in the pocket. And while I think it's going to last considerably longer than the Kovnatsky fight did, I do think that by sort of round five, round six, uh, Gerald Washington that, that gas tank is going to start to fade it's going to start to wear down and he again is going to get taken out so my prediction for that one is um, Derek Chisora sort of winning VR I think between round 6 and 7 um, up to round 9 it doesn't go past 9 rounds but I think it'll be a stoppage in the 6th or the 7th round for that fight <laughs> Now, moving on to the main event, Anthony Joshua versus Robert Hellenius. Now, Hellenius, as has been previously stated, is probably a better style matchup for Joshua in preparation for Deontay Wilder, but he's not the right, I guess, type of opponent to fully gauge where you're at to assess your levels compared to Wilder. Um, now, look, Wilder, fight before last, knocked him out within a round, but if you look at that fight primarily Hellenius was winning that round and he was making Deontay Wilder uncomfortable Deontay Wilder was obviously backing up and setting up a couple of traps which Hellenius did fall into but he did make Wilder uncomfortable in every fight where he has come forward and looked aggressive he's actually done very well like both the Kovnatsky fights he was aggressive he didn't just sort of sit back on the ropes um you had his fight with uh, even the fight with Duopas like he was he had a lot of success in that fight sort of coming forward um and pressing Duopas um a few other fights in between even the uh Obviously, when you saw him face Dillian White, that was on short notice on both on both guys' behalfs. He was a lot more negative in that fight, but he was able to survive the fight, and he was even able to badly buzz Dillian White. I think it was in the second round of that fight. So he's definitely got the necessary power. Um, it's just about whether or not he can, you know, necessary he can get that uh, sort of, you know, get that work off, so to speak. So with that being said. I feel like um, he's going to be a lot more aggressive and with Anthony Joshua not being a counter puncher it's going to be much easier I feel like for him to be able to um, exert some of that some of that you know uh, pressure and you know punch right in without necessarily having to worry about being countered for, for what he throws it's all going to be about Anthony Joshua being able to get the moments in order to enact his plan to work off of his jab and to sort of properly turn the shots over with the right hand. All of that being said, I do think that based on their, um, you know, based on their, their face off earlier on, I feel like Joshua almost feels a little bit insulted by the fact that Hellenius didn't quote unquote keep it professional and keep it cool break the gaze and just you know have the little stare or like he's you know kept his gaze he just kept watching him and Joshua he doesn't react well 
to to that for some reason he, he he just sees it as a form of disrespect and we saw basically what happened the last time someone held a gaze with him too long or quote unquote talk smack to him which was Dominic Brazil Brazil obviously being of similar height um, and dimensions to Robert Hellenius as well Joshua made this may be the right type of uh, opponent for him to to necessarily show what he's been working and I do think that within five rounds um, I don't think I don't think it would be as early as three because I do think Joshua will respect Hellenius's power but I do think within five rounds he's going to get to him and ultimately he's going to take him out in quite devastating fashion so the prediction is Anthony Joshua um, between four and five rounds KO but I'm, I'm gonna say five just to sort of be a bit generous now we're gonna move over to top rank okay so now you got Emmanuel Navarrete against Oscar Valdez short and sweet on this one um, Navarrete I feel has the more unorthodox and um, unconventional style he does sort of leap in behind shots he throws very awkward shots from very uncommon angles which is very tricky for a lot of athletes to read however you've got someone like Oscar Valdez who um, has a very deep amateur background as well as a pretty extensive professional background at this point he is the slightly older guy of the two but he seems to be very very handy when it comes to aggressive come forward fighters he's a great counter puncher and I do predict that at some point he's gonna walk uh, Navarrete onto something very very uh, dangerous probably more than once um, now if we look Navarrete was actually dropped I think what was it once or twice in his last fight I think it was once but he was rocked quite badly in that fight and the ref did give him a little bit of extra time he got some additional time in the corner um, after the knockdown with that I do think that um, Valdez hits harder not only does he hit harder, his punch placement is a lot cleaner um, and he knows Navarrete very well in terms of what to expect. So while I don't think it's going to be an easy fight for either person, I do think that Oscar Valdez does win this fight and does win it via KO probably around about the 8th or between 8 and 10th. So I'm going to say, yeah, between the 8th and the 10th round, um, Oscar Valdez to win this fight by KO and to take that WBO title. Last but not least, you've got Emmanuel Rodriguez, aka Manny Rodriguez, against Melvin Lopez for the vacant IBF Bantamweight Championship. Now, uh, Manny Rodriguez, I believe, is 21 and 2 as a professional, and Melvin Lopez, I think, is 29 and 1. Now, I haven't seen much of uh, Melvin Lopez to be totally honest but I know Manny Rodriguez was the mandatory challenger for the belt um, I still remember when he put on what I would deem a very clinical performance against Raymark Gobayo back in what, what was that 2020 I think it was and he was screwed out of um, screwed out of that shot um, he was he got given a split decision loss even though he won about nine to ten rounds of that fight clearly um by me every time i watch it, I, it it's one of those fights i can't watch too often because it it frustrates and annoys me how badly he was robbed in that in that particular fight um that being said obviously he's looking now to i believe this will be his third it will be his second second championship third attempt at a championship it will be his second championship if he's able to win now i haven't seen much of melvin lopez as i said but i've looked at the level of opponents that he's fought compared to the level of opponent that manny rodriguez has fought while that's not always an accurate gauge i can see rodriguez has been in there with the higher level of opposition overall consistently and Melvin Lopez from what I can remember the last time that he stepped up to you know the, the upper level so to speak he did get stopped uh, with that being said I feel like this was probably Rodriguez's last chance saloon so to speak and I feel like he will take it um, because it will lead to a big you know a big bantamweight unification 
down the line probably with Takuma Inoue uh, which I'm sure he would be he would welcome if not him it would be someone like Alexandro Santiago and uh, that would be Mexico versus Puerto Rico that would definitely do big numbers so I think he may be looking for something along those lines I do predict that he will win this fight um, and I predict he will win this fight via decision uh, I don't think he's going to step on the gas enough to try and get a KO but I do think that he will bank enough rounds and on this particular occasion he is the a-side not you know not the fighter that's backed by Manny Pacquiao or anything like that so I think that yeah with with what else is potentially on the horizon he he is the a-side and I do feel like they will more um you know favor him if it is close on the scorecards um but I don't think I don't predict it to be that close either way I do think he will win this fight either majority or split decision because he, he never seems to get a clean UD but uh, decision is the prediction so leave yours down below let me know what you think thank you for watching for right now that's basis picks locked